Okay, so it's a, it's a very great pleasure to present you Xenia. Oh, this the, <laughs> the last name is difficult. <laughs> Xenia D. <laughs> she is she is visiting us some um, this 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 summer, and she will speak about a short introduction to Grand Gross Prasad conjectures, and the that will be three lectures today, uh, Monday, uh, Monday is sixteen. Um, 19? Thursday 19, I think, yeah. And this first lecture is from Hecke to Walsburg. Okay. Um, thank you very much for inviting me here. It's a great, uh, it's, it's a big honor to be invited to the other side of the world to talk about maths. Uh, so thank you. Um, so yes, uh, my first, uh, this will be a very, very short introduction to uh, a series of conjectures um, that have been quite influential in the world of uh, autom in the automorphic world. Um, so as a little bit of an intuition about what we're going to be talking for the next um, uh, week or so, is that a very classical question one can ask is um, when you take a group and a subgroup of this group, you consider a representation, an irreducible representation of the big group, you restrict it to the smaller group and it will no longer necessarily be irreducible. But for nice enough groups, the irreducible components will appear with multiplicity one. Um, so the GGP conjectures are trying to describe this multiplicity, which is either zero or one, um, given specific uh, critical L values of automorphic representations we can attach um, to these groups. All right, so um, today will be a very basic introduction to uh, the GGP conjectures, and we will particularly talk about the work of Vals Pouget, who um, was the first to start thinking about um, describing these multiplicities in terms of L functions. So, um, yes, uh, without having said, I can begin. Um, so, the, the first uh, part of today's lecture uh, will be the work of Hecke. Um, later uh, today we will talk about the work of Vals Pouget. Vals -Pouget. Um, so this will be lecture one. And then on Monday uh, we will start talking about basics on automorphic forms. And then we will proceed to state the GGP conjectures. Um, so this will be lecture two. And then lecture three uh, will probably have two parts, but we'll see how much I can cover in an hour. Um, we'll see how today goes, practically is what I'm saying. But we will talk about uh, a refinement um, of the conjectures called the Ichino Ikeda refinement. And we will also try to give some brief ideas um, of how one can prove such conjectures. So this will be the third lecture. Um, but yeah, don't um, take this. Take this with a grain of salt. We'll see if we manage to cover everything or if we manage to cover more. All right. So um, let's start with the work of Hecke. Um, <clears throat> so consider a modular form. Um, as always, the story starts like this, and for simplicity, let's take it to be um, of level k and level uh, of weight k and just level one. And when we consider modular forms as such, we know that it has. Um, oops. Um, we know that um, it has Fourier expansion as a sum of Hecke eigenvalues. Oh. Great. So um, a thing we can do with modular forms, as you probably all know, is attach an L function to it. Uh, 
and the definition is, as you're probably all familiar with, Lf of s is equal to <coughs> the sum of a n um, n to the minus s. Great. So we can complete this L function. and get a completed L function, which we will just denote um, by capital lambda, which will just be um, 2 pi to the minus s, a gamma factor at s, and then the L function that we started with. Right, so this is the completed L function. And what's interesting about it is that Hecke showed Gamma here? Yes, sorry, it's not clear. Uh, let me rewrite this. Is this? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so, Hecke showed that uh, we can describe the completed L function as an integral now. And this is uh, the first appearance of integrals, but from now on, this is all that you'll be seeing. Um, so we can describe the L function as an integral of the imaginary part of the modular form that we started with times y to the s ds. Uh, yeah, dy, sorry. Um, right. Um, and this. Um, probably some of you recognize this. This is the Mellin transform of F. Um, yeah, great. Um, and Hege used this to show um, analytic continuation. and functional equation for RL function. function. Maybe you can just write that as a bit Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I'm too close to the board. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me? Yes. Is it, is it, is it, is it, is it y or y or is it just like that? I'm just comparing Sorry, it's with the gamma function, it's like also the many transform. I, I was wondering if, 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 if it is y to the s minus one or is it just plus y to the s? I think it's y to the this is, okay, s. I, I'm just, I, uh, I'm, I am not an expert, I'm, that's why I'm asking. Uh, yeah, I think, I, think, I think it's y because to the Because the gamma function is y to the s minus 1, and it's also the military form. I don't know. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I can check later, but I, yeah, think, I think it's y to the s. Um, yeah. If someone else, like yeah, online or here, can correct me. <laughs> um, I, think, I think it well, might well, be s, s minus 1. Because oh, okay. Lf1 okay. is like the integral of f dy. Great. But it's normalization. Normalization. It's um, so, yeah, Hege used this to show analytic continuation. And functional equation. For our L function. Um, just for completion. Um, right, and this way, um, maybe I can fit it here. So, um, from this identity here, if we plug in s is equal to k over 2, we get l f, oops, l f k over 2, is equal to the integral from 0 to infinity f of i y y to the k over 2 I guess minus 1 dy um, and this is what we called what we call a central value formula so the GGP conjectures are trying to generalize um, identities like this where instead of f perhaps we have a bigger um, algebraic object which is an automorphic representation um, 
but this should give you some intuition about where we're moving on uh, from here. So Vals Puget um, showed this for um, that we can have similar central values for uh, central value formulas for automorphic representations attached to GL2. But in order to move from this world um, to automorphic representations, we need to do a, a very, very short interlude on um, um, a short interlude on the um, Adelic setting. Is Xenia? Yes. About timing, so I think we have one hour, one hour and a half is fine. So if so okay. it's okay. So don't worry about. Um, am I going too fast? <laughs> No, no, we, no, no, okay, because okay. you were telling me that you will be fast, but don't, don't worry. So, okay. <laughs> so if, if um, we have time. Great, thank you. Um, so I'll just write here that this is the type of identity. Uh, that the GGP conjectures are trying to generalize. Sorry if that's too small, but um, I said it. All right, so um, let's do a small, very, very short interlude. Um, on how to pass from modular forms. To um, the Adelic setting i.e. to automorphic representations. Oops. Okay. Um, so this will be very, very short, um, but it should give you like a brief intuition about what is going on. And then next week, we're going to define automorphic representations for, gener uh, for uh, bigger groups so um, perhaps that way you'll get more intuition about why we care about these objects. Um, all right, so um, this will be a bunch of statements. Uh, I won't prove things that I will uh, explain here, but when I put up the notes, I'll, I'll give you a bunch of references if you want to look uh, at it in more depth. All right, so um, there's a very beautiful theorem in number theory called strong approximation. And it tells us that GL2 of the Adels, oops, <laughs> is actually equal to GL2Q, just the rational numbers, GL2R plus times K, where K is an open compact subgroup and um, just for completion uh, GL2 R plus is just the elements of GL2 R that just have positive determinants. Great. So this is a very strong theorem, but it practically allows us to define functions on the adults by not looking at the whole group. Oh, one observation, yes. isn't it? There, K, uh, for a specific case, you have that, not for everyone, I think, no? Yeah, where K is sum. Um, yeah, maybe... You, it's a specific, let's just say. Yeah, for some specifics you yes. have that, but I, I think for other one, not maybe if you take K, uh, KN, which is without zero and without one, mm -hmm. that's mean matrices which are congruent to the identity modulo N, mm -hmm. maybe you have a disjoint union on the left, or maybe confused. Uh, um. But... It's certainly true for the case you want, the case of K, 
Sure, yes. Yeah, yeah, maybe you um, can to avoid maybe... Problems. Yeah, okay, let's just say a specific one for now. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think it's true if debt K is like Z hat star. Yeah. If that makes sense. You want the determinant to be as large as possible. Which is going to be true. In yes, I, th I think I think I think this is right. Yes. Yeah. All right. And you need to precise where is K, no? K is inside something. Oh, no, we will see later the, the good K that you want. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah okay. Yes. okay. Um, I'm not sure if there is. This. Oh, oh, sorry. All right. Um, where was I? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so now we want to attach uh, to this modular form a function on this. And we do it in a very specific way. Um, we will call it phi of f. And we start from GL2R plus. We project onto GL2R plus, where we mod out by um, GL2Q. No, uh, sorry, I have a typo here and I'm a bit confused. Um, on the right, we mod out by this K, and I think here we mod out by GL2Q. Um, and now we can map this to the upper half plane, where the map here is you take a matrix A, B, C, D, and you send it to a i plus b over c i plus d and then finally we know that our modular form is a function on the upper half plane so we can just map this via f on c did i write something wrong yes i probably yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well it's one observation yeah on, on the left you need to start in gel 2a i think that you want something adelic no okay this you just have to wait because because of strong approximation now we can view this as a function on gl2a right uh, but k is an open compact of gl2 of z uh, hat okay sure so sure, yeah sure. that's you're, you're right. yeah, yeah you're so right. it doesn't make yes. a lot of sense the double yes. quotient you're right okay so now so the double quotient you need to take care now so now, on the double quotient, do we have issues? Yeah, because K is an open compact subgroup of which group? OK. Um, let's I think K and gamma here. just shouldn't be in this. Um, K and gamma are going to come out later, aren't they? Let's just say that gamma is the inter intersection of GL2Q with GL2R plus times K. Okay, so take K, yes. maybe if you are precise, you avoid problems. So take K equals the product. Yeah, K is the product of over all the primes L mm -hmm. of oh, GL2, you know, GL2. Uh, Z L oh Z uh, yes yeah. yeah <clears throat> that is the K that you are going to use this sure, in, on the this gamma yeah. the, in the double quotient mm -hmm. this is kind of almost very close to the symmetric space you use always so the gamma will be gel two Q okay and no no that, that's okay no that's in this in the double quotient in the, in the middle yeah. In the double quotient, gamma should be GL2K, GL2Q. Okay, okay. And this, yeah, that is okay. And the GL2R, the double quotient, still doesn't make an, a lot of sense because K is not a subgroup of GL2R. It's exactly the opposite. So you need to take GL2A. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And now you are close. Now this gamma is very precise. Is just maybe this gamma is this no? The intersection of GL two Q with 
Oh, this. Sorry. No, no, it's, it's fine. I, I, I think it's the gamma there. Before. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. Gamma. That will be the gamma now. SL two uh, Z that you want. So that is equal to SL two Z. All and right. now all the arrows are <laughs> used. All right. Thank you. That is as you want because it's wait, level one. No? Yes, yes, yeah, you're yeah. right. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, all right. So that was a mess. I'm sorry. But um, let's describe it again. So you start with a function on GL2 of the Adels. And you project down to the double quotient of the specific open compact you've started with and GL2 Q. Then via this map here that um, you can't really see very well now, you can go on the upper half plane. And from the upper half plane, we can just use our modular form to uh, go on to C. All right. Um, now, this function has nice properties. Um, firstly, it's of moderate growth, which I won't define, but we will explain this particular part next week a bit more um, explicitly. Um, it's k finite, um, and it's also z of GL2 finite, uh, where uh, small GL2 is just a Lie algebra. And thirdly, it's smooth. Um, and the interesting part about these uh, conditions is that functions that functions like this are called automorphic forms. On GL two. Um, Maybe I can use call. Um, and uh, we denote the space of such functions by A of GL2. Great. Um, Any questions? I probably confused the people that didn't know this already. So. Can I, I just say a stupid thing? I, mean, I, I think what, what you said is, is not correct. I mean, what she wrote down is, is, is okay. She, she was only looking at the infinite part of the Adels. That's why she got a GL2 of R. And then that's why she sent the matrix A, B, C, D to A, I plus B over C, I plus D. I mean, if you take an Adel map, the, the map that she wrote doesn't make any sense. So yeah, I, I think yeah, that the, the right. R was correct, but but the only thing that you have to, to consider that the K that, that she's considering is only the infinity part of the of the compact group. Yes, so and, uh, that, that is, oops, and, and, that, that is and the, the, the only stupid remark is that it's not exactly the function f but you you have to multiply by the chain variant to the minus k so it's invariant on the gamma but but that's okay i mean it's it's just a, a, the usual technical way to define f from the quotient to c right i mean i mean f, f is not well defined on the quotient but if you multiply by j of uh, c to the minus k or whatever then it's invariant but, but that's just i mean it, it, it's oh. a standard so, so i wouldn't spend too much time on that <laughs> no, no, it's fine. No, 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 that, that is absolutely fine. It's better if we do this correctly. So um, let's just write here F tilde, where F tilde is F multiplied by the J invariant <coughs> to pi or minus K, you said? Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so it's invariant, yeah. All right. Um, but... So we take GL2 of the adults. We project down to this double quotient, where on the left we quotient down by the rational points, and here we quotient out by k prime, where k prime is k intersected by GL2R, so that this quotient makes sense. And then through this uh, map here, where we send the matrix to just this um, number, uh, we can view this as an element of the upper half plane. And then we use our modular form times um, the J invariant to the power of minus k to 
uh, go down to the uh, complex numbers. All right. But this k prime is one, no? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Daniel. So, so you you can assume that k prime. But so, so the thing is, you, you're sending e to a i plus b over c i plus t. So it's the stabilizer of i. That's k prime. So it's I mean, you you have to take a compact group, right? No, no, so it's, it's okay. But if you take k prime equals one, maybe it makes sense. But no, before it was also makes sense one. because you take the infinity part, you know, or kind but of. But you cannot take k prime equals one. It has to be the stabilizer of i. It's O two of r. It's a compact group, a maximal compact group. Yeah, you can take that, but this, there is a projection in any case, no? Uh, yeah, an arrow. But, but, yes, but what she wrote there, I think it's an isomorphism, or, or, or almost. Yeah, an I think it's an isomorphism. K prime might, <laughs> might not be maximal. If it's maximal, but, it's an isomorphism. But, but that k prime is one. That is my point. But, but one is not open, Daniel. You have to take but, an open. No, but open look, k prime is equal k intersection gl to r. K yeah. is finite and r is infinite. What is intersection? One. No, no, no. K is not finite. K is an open compact group of the adults. So it has an open compact group at infinity as well. But this is very not standard to, to say that. <laughs> you take O2 of R, this is what you take in general. In, in your definition of K, you, you only consider the finite things, but you have also to include the infinite part. So you need to, yeah, to take but... GL2 of, I mean, a, a compact maximum subgroup at infinity. But in a str matter, strong I mean. approximation, you take K, an open subgroup of GL2 AF, no? The finite adult in a strong approximation. Yes, yes. So that K is fine. You're both saying correct things, but it's just normalizations. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Maybe we should next send you a carry on. <laughs> okay. Um, let's just say plus normalizations. Yeah, normalizations is a word that covers everything. <laughs> Better do the heavy lifting. All right. So. Yes, um, plus some assumptions that make all this make sense. Um, all right, so um, through some magic, we have moved from our modular form to a, uh, a notomorphic representation, uh, and sorry, a notomorphic form, which is a function on the adults that has these three properties. It's of moderate growth, it's smooth, and it's left k, sorry, right k finite, and it's also finite. Um, ZGL2 finite, which is um, the Lie algebra. So functions like this are called automorphic forms on GL2, and we denote this space by A of GL2. And now, the interesting thing, uh, well, uh, the thing is that if we consider the uh, subspace of A of GL2 generated by phi of F, we end up getting um, what is called an automorphic representation, which we denote by pi of F which is um, an irreducible subportion of A of GL2, or in the, in the way that I have defined it is isomorphic to one. Right, so to this object now, uh, we can attach an L function. Um, uh, which is the group acting here? When you mention irreducibility, you are thinking about a group acting. No? Um, it's GL two of the adults, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. 
Yes, and that, that I guess is a key point that I should highlight, um, which is why we're defining this space AGL2. AGL2 is functions like this. So, um, yeah, it's, um, So A of GL2 are functions like this that satisfy these very nice properties and irreducible subquotients of this are representations of GL2 of the adults. So we have moved on from a modular form to a function on a modular form to a representation, sorry, to a function of GL2 of the adults and from that to a representation of GL2 of the adults. Uh, and to this object, we can attach an L function which next time we will define very carefully using Sataki parameters for generic automorphic representations. But for now, just think of this as the same thing as the L function that we started with, uh, L of F. Um, so for now, think of this as the L function that we started with. So, um, Maybe I shouldn't have deleted it, but the idea was that we had a central um, uh, value formula for this, and now we can move it to a central value formula for this. And how we do this uh, is very, very simple. Um, Uh, so before I move on to explain um, how we adjust our central value formula, are there any questions? Right, so um, under the bijection that we wrote down before, um, well, in the case that we wrote it, um, it was an isomorphism. Um, uh, the key point is that um, the torus maps to this. Um, so Hegel's central value formula um, can be seen as integrating over the torus. And specifically, yes, Why? because uh, I should have put T. Um, just, uh, I'm just used to uh, writing IY instead of, thank you. Um, Yes, so um, the torus maps to um, IT. So specifically, our central value formula can be seen as L of pi F. S is equal to an integral over phi F. T001 dt, where we're integrating over A, where A is the torus. Right, well, the way I've written it, I should not say A here, I should say A, the adult molecule cross. And, um, there, there should be here a one half due to normalizations. Uh, 
again, but um, this is the keyword that I'm going to use from now on to not explain exactly why this one half appears here. Um, but um, the idea is that we denote the right hand side by P of A phi F, where A is the torus. And we call this an automorphic period integral. So we have moved on from looking at our L function uh, attached to F. Um, maybe I should write this somewhat here. Uh, we have moved on from Hegge's formula to a very, very similar um, central value formula, but now we have, well, here it's not S, it's one half, um, to this. Yes. 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 The integral is a. What is below the integral? It's a of the adults cross. So. Okay. Mod out on the left by two. Okay. Anything else? Can I ask you a, a more philosophical question? So, so how, how did you choose your torus? I mean, is there any particular way to, to choose the torus or any choice of, of a torus? With, with Very your... good question. Um, so this is exactly where we're going now. Um, so, okay, this is a bit of a spoiler, but the idea is that for this specific torus, we have this, um, and you'll see now for how with this specific torus, we can have a an even more explicit description of this central value formula. And then from then on, we will see how we can move on from this specific torus to any torus, to any tori. Um, but yeah, you, you have the exact right idea of where this is going. Um, right, so now, um, this might be a little bit boring, but I will um, have to write down some formulas. Um, so, recall the Peterson inner product formula. Which is brackets FF is equal to the absolute value of f of z squared uh, y to the k minus 2 dx dy. Um, and now uh, the, the, the cool thing about this is that Rankin, Rankin and Selberg showed that one can express this Peterson inner product in terms of L values. And in particular, you have that the Peterson inner product of our modular form is equal to 2 pi k to the minus 1 times the residue at s is equal to k of the completed L function of the product of two modular forms now at s, uh, comma s. All right. Now, th this part here by definition is equal to um, 2 to the minus k l of one of pi f adjoint um i should probably also define this somewhere but when we write um this we just mean um l of s of pi times pi uh, bar and you divide by the zeta function um 
All right, so we get this formula where we can now relate the Peterson inner product to the automorphic representation attached to our modular form. And um, so this is the right hand side. And the left hand side is equal to um, this. Uh, but again, you do normalizations, you get a pi over six. And what is this thing here is pi over six integral of phi f, f of g squared dg. Um, all right, so we now get Means oh, I shouldn't define that. Thank you. Um, this is okay. Uh, I'll just keep it like that. <laughs> and then just right up here. Um, this is really not the short people friendly. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, GL2 of the Adels mod out by GL2 of Q and you mod out by the center of GL2. Um, right, so now we get the actual formula that we will uh, try to generalize, which is, okay, so we take our automorphic period integral, P A phi F, which is defined as this. And we square it and we divide by phi f, phi f brackets. Now, this is equal to, well, the top part by this equality here, by one, we get that this is L one half phi f squared. And then we get M one over four here, I guess. And then this here, by this, which will denote by two, is equal to six over pi, oh, pi over six, f, f. Great. Now, by three, my number is getting a bit weird now, but hopefully you're all following. So now by this, we get I think this is, this might be six over pi. No, this is six over pi, okay. Yes, okay, yes. Um, because this is equal to six over pi times that, right. Um, so we get, um, two to the K by three, uh, pi over six. Uh, I guess here we have a minus two as well from this. And then we get L of one half pi F squared over L of one pi F add. Well, add is the adjoint. Right, so I can use color again now and tell you that Oops, I think I broke this, <laughs> sorry. Um, um, the, 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 the interesting thing is that the Riemann zeta function appears here again, why? Because um, 2k pi, 2k minus one, sorry. Uh, uh, uh. 2k minus two pi over six is equal to uh, 2k minus 4 of c2, where c oh, is the completed um, Riemann zeta function. The same appearing 
Okay. Yes. Um, great. Um, all this hopefully is clear now. Um, I did not put the one here. Sorry. So is this clear to everyone? Compute this just a bunch of computations. I will leave this bottom part here um, for now. So, we have pi a pi f squared over f f of pi f pi f is equal to 2 to the k minus 2 pi over 6 l of 1 half pi f squared over L1 pi F adjoint. And in particular, one can show that the adjoint L function attached to uh, pi F has no pole or zero at s is equal to one and therefore this is okay we can actually write this down and um therefore we get that pi of a of phi f is non-zero if and only if l of pi f one half is non-zero so on one side of this we have um, automorphic period integrals and on the other one we have um, the central value of our L function so now we have moved from understanding this to understanding automorphic period integrals and as Ariel said before um, we can do this for more general theory um, and that's the cool thing you will practically get a very, very similar identities to this. And that is what Valtz Bouget actually observed and started doing. Um, so, um, has any, is anybody, everybody okay with this? Okay. I just saw some of you still writing, so I just wanted to make sure. I'll put up notes anyway, so. Right, but before we move on to uh, explaining how we can generalize this to any Tori, um, the cool thing is that we can, we have this, the exact same formula, well, we have the same up to some correction factors formula for any um, caspidol which I haven't defined automorphic representation pi of GL2 and any pi in pi. Right, so um, it's pretty much the, the same thing, but you need to have some correction factors. So I'll write down the formula now. But the idea is the same. You have the automorphic period integral here, where instead of phi f, we just have phi. Um, and then you divide by this, uh, which I just deleted, but the definition of it is the exact same one that I gave before for our specific one. And now you take zeta 2 over 2 L s 1 half pi squared over the residue 
at s is equal to 1 of zeta s l s 1 pi add and then you have I will explain all this I just want to write it down all right so you have this big complicated formula that kind of looks very similar to this the zeta function appears again here and then you have very 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 similar things on the nominator but you do have this mysterious thing here so um let's proceed to explain this a little bit slowly so s is a specific set uh, sufficiently large of places. Um, and you need to include the Archimedean place, R. Um, and this mysterious correction factor that appears here is the integral over the torus QV of pi V A B pi V pi V over pi V pi V D A V. And now, again, you, I'm not explaining why all this makes sense. Um, you need to take normalizations. But um, you need to be particular, particularly careful about how you choose these uh, measures. Um, practically, you choose them so that the product of all the local ones is just the Tamagawa measure. And the idea is that for almost all v, we get that this mysterious correction factor is just what it should, what this whole thing um, should look locally uh, at s, which is um, zeta v of 2 over zeta v at 1, l of 1 half pi v squared over l 1 pi v adjoint so this is pretty much exactly this is just that you might not have this exact identity at all the local place yes so oh um so so, so this s is a specific set of yeah, yeah yeah it's the same um it's a specific set of sufficiently large places here you define your l function at all those places and you time uh, sorry yeah and then you times it by these local factors at, uh, so you can see what happens at s um all right so we can see that we have the same identity as we started with before but in a more and more general setting and now we can actually do this exact thing for any torus um but um the thing is that this is not too hard to prove um this was proved way before Val Spouget came into wait 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 for um it was probably a lot um do you remember when I gave it yeah early 1900 maybe okay. first half of 20th century no? oh maybe I'm... okay maybe Val Spouget was maybe, alive I maybe don't know. Wikipedia maybe can he was a baby <laughs> um um, but yeah, the thing yeah. is that. Uh, let me ask you a, a question. In, in this in this integral that you wrote, is pi v of a w or, or something? So uh, are you taking this as the torus, the matrix a zero zero one, when you define the alpha v? Yes, yes, exactly. Um, okay. A a is the torus that I defined before. Um, okay, okay. P zero zero one. And now I write QV, so T is an element of QV. Um, right, right. So uh, one can show. Uh, you say that you're, this, is still, this is still not what not was project. No. Okay, okay. No, uh, because we're working for a with a specific torus. 
and yes, I do realize that I'm already at one hour. So, oh, it's fine. So okay, you, you did tell me, yes. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> um, so one can show that these alpha v's, these correction factors, are not identically aren't identically zero. And again, L S pi add has no pole or zero up s is equal to one. So again, we get a very, very similar thing to what we started with, which is that pi a of f is non zero if and only if L of one pi add, oh, definitely not that. Um, um, let me just rewrite this. So we get that on one hand, L of one half of pi, which is now any capital automorphic representation of GL2 is non-zero, if and only if there exists some phi in pi such that this thing doesn't vanish. And we, we now have this extra condition because these AVs are not identically zero, so you can choose specific local components such that um, this thing doesn't vanish and you can choose them in a way that they all form an element of pi. Um, and I should just have written here for completion that we write phi as a product of local components. Um, all right, so is this clear so far? Okay, so this... So, so are, you saying, are you saying that the alpha b is not identically zero or it's never zero? No, it's not identically zero. So there okay. exists elements phi v such that this thing doesn't okay. vanish. Okay, uh, but, but if, the you way you can make... choice, if you make the wrong choice, you might get the zero on the right hand side and on the left hand side for trivial reasons. I didn't understand the last part. I, I, I mean, you, you make, make, you can take some choice where the, the right hand side vanishes because you choose the wrong pi b. That's, that's what you're saying. It might happen that. Yes, it might happen that for some specific phi v it vanishes, but it doesn't vanish identically. So I can always find an element of pi such that it's a tensor product of specific phi v's such that all these phi v's don't vanish at s. So then I can have this interesting thing that is going on here. And this is what Valz Pouget, wow, I cannot misspell this name, so wow. Generalized for any non trivial torus of GL2. So now we can proceed to um, state Valspuget's theorem. Um, we will need some notation, obviously, at the beginning. Um, but we're almost there. Right, so what are these non-trivial tori that we're going to consider? Um, <clears throat> um, so we had A was the standard torus. Ah, it's up there. Okay, let me just write standard torus here. It's just that. And now, consider K over K prime, a quadratic extension of number fields. Now, um, such, by such I mean this, non-trivial, such torus, such tori, um, look like 
T, which is the restriction from K to K prime. It's not really nice to have the K prime there, so let's just put it here. Mm -hmm. um, from K prime to K of GM. Um, and you can see that this is just GM, right? It's just the only thing that varies is this T. Um, good. So, um, uh, and the final piece of notation that we need to, to state the theorem is that we let eta be a cross mod k cross, yes, k cross, um, 2 plus minus 1, which is the quadratic character associated to the quadratic extension k prime k. So now the Adels that you are using yes. there, the Adels are <laughs> of k prime. Okay. Thank you. Of k of k prime k prime. Oh, yeah. No, it's fine. Yeah. Um. Huh. All right. Um. It'd be nice if I could still have this on the board, but like, just remember. Um. So now we have theorem which is for every pi a caspidal automorphic representation. of GL2 and any phi in pi, which now I will just for completion write it like this. We have the automorphic period integral now where we're integrating over this torus T and not A squared over FF is equal to the zeta function at k of 2 over 4 times L 1 half pi times L 1 half, where now we have an extra factor here, pi times eta, where eta is the quadratic character, over L, well, yes, L 1 pi adjoint uh, times L 1 eta, and then we have again those correction factors that appear appeared on this board before, which is um, Right, so this formula looks identical to practically what we had before on the board, um, but it's, mu it's much, much harder to prove. So before what we had on the board, we, we said, okay, we want this to be zero, or if and only if this thing is zero. And we could do that because these things didn't vanish identically, so we could speak peak specific phi's uh, such that that would be true. But also we have this equality because as we saw at the beginning with Hecke's work, we had a, um, we had um, yes, we had a specific connection between the automorphic period integral, which we defined it to be here at s is equal to one half, and this. But in this more general setting, you don't have such a trivial way to explain this. So this is why this was like proved much much later and it took a very serious amount of work um so um i will just write this down here for completion that this is much harder to prove for two reasons one 
AVs can vanish identically. And two, we don't have um, yeah, we don't have a relation, a direct relation between PT at phi and L at one half of pi. All right. So, um, it no, sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, the last term, the correction term, uh, V is a place where. Um, yeah, um, yeah sorry. sorry. You have, you have the, the exact, exact same situation, situation as we did before, before where you define this, this at uh, specific, specific places. Did I forget it somewhere? Uh -uh -uh. Can, can, can you yes. define the, the PT as an integral as before or? Yes. Um, yes, maybe I can write it down for completion. Um, but it's exactly what we had before. Um, just to be precise, so pi is a representation of GL2 AK, no, no? Adults K. Yes, thank you. Oh, no, you, you, wrote, you wrote there, gel 2 gel. Oh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> but but are, are you assuming that it has trivial central character or something like this, or, or not really? I, I don't think you actually have to assume that, no. No. Um, someone asked me to define something. Oh, the period integral, yes. Um, so this is just integrating over the torus. Yes, so thank you. You have brackets again, which is the same as this. So maybe I should have been uh, more precise here um, because we will use this notation uh, for the rest of the course. When we write brackets G, I mean uh, G of the adults over whatever it is that we're working over. Maybe here it's K, uh, GL2K, and then again, you consider out, portion out by the center of G. Right, so when I write the torus here, you just put T everywhere. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm a little confused. When you define oh, thank the you, torus- thank you. Yes, I did write GLT here. Yeah. Yes, is that, <laughs> sorry, uh, go on. Yeah. No, when you define the torus, so, so you took a quadratic extension K over K prime. So your automorphic form should be a form of K prime? I, I changed the K prime to- um, or, 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 or uh, we, we, can, we can switch one, the, I don't the, remember the which was one. K is the base. K, K, K was is the base. base, yes. K was the base. So if K the base, so, okay, so, so your quadratic extension is K prime over K. But, but when you define the torus, you also take the quotient, right? So you took the restriction of the multiplicative group, and then you quotient by the multiplicative group of the restriction, right? I, I, I didn't understand. No, so so when you define the, the, the torus, you took the restriction of the multiplicative group. Yes, exactly. And and then you quotient by something, right? Because it was something of dimension one. Yes, it was GMK prime, the big one, GMK. So it was the restriction of GM of K prime. Yes. Okay. But but for doing that, don't you need to assume that the central character is trivial? I mean, you want your form to be invariant on oh, the quotient, right? I see what you were saying now. That's that's why I asked about the central character. Yes. I think you're right. 
So thank you very much. Yes. Um, for uh, the most representation of GL2. Um, Trivial central card. And Thank you. Um, that was an important point. Yes. Um, so it turns out, and this is the final thing that I will say. <clears throat> um, it turns out that alpha v to be not identically zero uh, happens only if um, the home space uh, when we restrict to tv of pi v c is non-zero that means that when i take my representation pi of v of gl2 av uh, gl2 v um, and i restrict it to the torus i can find the trivial representation inside of it so The theorem implies that we have that there exists some phi in pi such that the automorphic period integral doesn't vanish if and only if L one half pi times L one half pi times eta, the quadratic character, is non-zero. And we have this condition for every place. All right. So um, we have moved on to a more general um, construction now that all, like, intuitively works very similarly to what we started with initially with the work of Hegel. Um, and the idea is now moving forward that um, we want to get rid of this extra condition. And to do that, you need to consider something called inner forms of your group. So we will see that next time uh, in the much more general case, where now pi is not just an automorphic representation of GL2, but of bigger groups which are orthogonal and unitary. And the conditions will be very, very similar. Uh, any questions? Uh, some questions? Do you have any observation questions about this or the next lectures? Yes, I have a question. Oh, sure. uh, the last, the last thing, uh, inequality, oh, equality, uh, is for all places v in S, or for you all do places? have it for the places that um, the other yeah. ones. So it doesn't harm to just write it like this. If that makes sense. I don't so understand. So the places that are not in S <laughs> satisfy this condition. Okay. More questions or observations? No? So just, just a question. So this was for any number to k, right? So you didn't make any assumption. Yes, any, any, make... any quadratic extension k prime k for any k base field. Yes, number field. Yes. Can I ask something? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. So this this is for any cluster of more representation. You don't you don't need some kind of like regular algebraic or no you so don't it would work okay. for like mass forms as well things like that but you do apparently need the trivial central card okay cool. thanks oh more 
Oh, if there are no, ah, Ariel. One, one, one stupid remark. I mean, the, the trivial set of character, you need therefore for the functional equation to be symmetric, right? I mean, otherwise it, it doesn't apply to the same function. You get the function and the conjugate or something like this. If your central character is not trivial. So, I, I mean, you don't have a, 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 a symmetry uh, if your function has a character, right? That, that's why it, it makes sense to, to impose the condition if you want to, to get some central values. Oh, more observations, more remarks? Oh, if not, let thanks again for this nice first lecture, Senia. Thank you.